This lesson is 2.2.2, .2, Aircraft Engines, focusing on the types and their placement. So the big concept of this lesson is that you will explore the various types of aircraft engines, how they operate, as well as their placement on aircraft. So let's start by taking a look at the types of propulsion systems. All propulsion systems are driven by an engine. They can be a propeller attached to a reciprocating engine. They can be a gas turbine, also called jet, ramjet and scramjet, or rocket. Now, this lesson will focus on propeller and turbine propulsion systems specifically. So let's take a look at the main engine categories. First, we have reciprocating. Now, reciprocating engines contain pistons. We have gasoline-powered, which include two-stroke and four-stroke engines, diesel-powered, which are not typical in an aircraft, and gas turbine, which can include turbojet, turbofan, turboprop, and afterburning turbojet. So let's start by taking a look at the propeller two-stroke engine. Four operations occur in one revolution inside of this engine, and it typically powers smaller engines. Uh, the examples include ultralight aircraft, dirt bikes, lawnmowers, and generators. In comparison to four-stroke engines, they're typically more powerful, they have a higher fuel consumption, and they're much louder. Now, the four-stroke engine has four operations occur in just two revolutions. These are typically found in automobiles and small aircraft. Now, compared to two-stroke engines, they're more fuel-efficient and they're quieter. So let's take a look at reciprocating engine carburetor. Now, the reciprocating engine carburetor mixes fuel and air for an engine. The carburetor reduces cross-sectional area of the air as it passes through, and the air velocity increases as the pressure lowers at the reduction, which creates a vacuum. This draws fuel into the vacuum to mix with the air. Then Bernoulli's law applies, also known as the Venturi effect, and the carburetor is only used on gas engines unless they're fuel injected. Now the problem with the engine carburetor is that icing can be a problem. Water vapor condenses in reduced air pressure, which can cause blockages of air through the carburetor, but heated air from the engine can prevent the icing. So now let's take a look at some gas turbine engines. The first, let's take a look at the types. So turbojet, turbofan, turboprop, and afterburning turbojet. Now air flows continuously through the engine, so every one of these engines has an intake, compression, power or combustion, and exhaust. When we look at gas turbine propulsion, the gas engine turns a shaft, which is attached to a fan blade and sometimes a propeller um, in turboprops especially. Fans or propellers move the air to provide the propulsion. The air moves continually through the gas turbine engine stage. So the air enters the inlet, the air is then compressed with fan blades, the fuel is added in the burner or the combustor so the air temperature increases. Then the air expands, releasing energy to spin the shaft connected to the compressor fan blades, and the air accelerates. The fast-moving air forces out of the nozzle and causes propulsion. Here you'll see a diagram that actually demonstrates the different areas that were just mentioned on the previous slide. So we begin at the inlet, air then travels into the compressor, the shaft moves, we have the burner, turbine, and then lastly, out the nozzle. So the compressor supplies a high pressure air to the burner or the combustor where it's heated by the burning fuel. The flow leaving the combustor has a lot of energy. Now let's take a look at the bypass ratio. So some gas turbine engines split into two air streams at the inlet. The center core of air is sent through the stages and some of the air, the bypass air, flows around the core. We can calculate the bypass ratio by dividing the bypass volume by the core volume. So the Bypass air surrounds the center air with slow moving cone of air, which can result in a higher fuel efficiency, lower thrust, and a quieter engine. Now a turbojet has no bypass. The turbofan has three different bypass ratios. It can be low, medium, or high. You can see some examples in the slide. And the turboprop has a bypass ratio of around 50. So let's take an overview of the turbojet. Now this is the simplest and earliest gas turbine. It has no bypass and it's still widely used for military purposes. It has high thrust for maneuverability and speed and there's little concern for fuel efficiency and little concern for noise abatement, meaning they're loud. So here's an example of an aircraft that uses a turbojet. This is the SR-71. And does anyone know what other name this aircraft is known by? If you can answer that in class, I will exempt you from the conclusion questions. Okay, so let's do the turbofan. 
So bypass ratios in a turbofan are typically 0.5 through 15. Uh, they're used by modern military and commercial aircraft. It combines high power and low speed and altitude performance. The turbofan engines are recognizable with large air intake diameters on the front. And then it has a high bypass ratio, which is typically for civilian aircraft, and it can also have a low bypass ratio, which is typically for military aircraft. So if we look at the turbofan operation, you can see in the graph here, we are comparing uh, the performance of the um, turbofan dependent upon the pressure and the, the bottom of the graph got cut off, ah, the, <laughs> the altitude. So you can compare that graph. I will make sure to put this in classroom so you can see it more thoroughly. Okay, so the turboprop is a gas turbine engine with power turbine that turns a propeller. The propellers are attached to the gas turbine shaft, um, which develop thrust by moving large masses of air through, small, uh, through a small change in velocity. They're usually used in low-speed transport aircraft and small commuter aircraft. And the turbo shaft is similar, but drives a rotor for helicopters. So now we have the afterburning turbojet, and most military fighter jet engines, turbojet and turbofan, have afterburners. This helps exceed drag close to the sound barrier. The nozzle is extended and fuel is injected in hot gases for extra thrust. Uh, they have inefficient combustion, and they use a lot of fuel. So this is a graphic of a afterburning turbofan. I highly recommend that you take this and compare it to the other one that we saw because you can see the differences between this where the afterburn actually occurs. So let's take a look at engine placement. So we have a few different engine, arra engine arrangements. First we have the underwing. So the underwing it means that the engine weight is close to the lift generator and it reduces wing structure. We can also put the engine in the rear fuselage, and sometimes we have a mix of the underwing and the rear fuselage. So all engines must perform four basic operations. They all must have an intake, which is where the fuel and air must be brought into the engine. They must all have a place for compression, which is where the fuel and air mixture has to be squeezed together. Then it must have an area for power, so where the fuel and air mixture must be ignited for the gases to provide engine power, and the exhaust, which is where gases have to be cleared before the next cycle. There are some alternative uses for gas turbine engines. They can also be used to power racing cars, ships, electric power generators, and natural gas pumping stations. The purpose of a gas turbine engine is to generate thrust to propel an aircraft or to generate shaft power. Thrust is a force generated by accelerating air, and the thrust is the rate of change of momentum. You want to jot down these formulas down here below. You'll need them for your assignment. So a gas turbine engine has very specific inputs and outputs. The inputs include the Mach number, altitude, bypass ratio, the FPR or fan pressure ratio, the CPR, the compressor, compressor pressure ratio, and the fuel to air ratio. The outputs include thrust and specific fuel consumption. So let's take a closer look at the inputs. First, we have the Mach number. Now, Mach 1 is approximately 761 miles per hour uh, for an aircraft traveling around mean sea level. Then we also have the altitude, which is uh, measured above mean sea level, or MSL. Uh, and the units for this are feet or meters. And then we also have the bypass ratio, which again is calculated by the volume bypass divided by the volume core air, and that is unitless. We then have the fan pressure ratio, or FPR. This is the fan discharge pressure, which is measured in PSI or PA, divided by the fan inlet pressure, again PSI or PA. The typical range for this value is 1.5 to 2.2, and that is unitless. We also have the compressor pressure ratio, CPR. This is a discharge pressure at the nozzle, which is measured in PSI or PA, divided by the inlet pressure at the front of the compressor, also in PSI or PA. Your typical range is 20 to 60, and that again is unitless. We then have the fuel to air ratio, so that's mass fuel, which is either which is unit by pound M or PA divided by mass air, which is again pound M or PA. And that's approximately 0 0.015, and again, unitless. So then we have thrust, and that's measured in units of force, such as pound force or newtons. We have specific fuel consumption, which is FFSFC. The full term is thrust specific fuel consumption. The fuel consumption is either pound mass per hour or thrust uh, or divided by thrust, which is in pound forces, or we can do, or we can calculate it by fuel consumption in kilograms per hour divided by thrust, and that would be in newtons. 
This is the inverse of the automo automobile mileage efficiency, where we want high miles per gallon. The act we actually want a low specific fuel consumption, meaning fuel consumption per thrust is lower, so that's actually better.